with that, I'm going to turn it over and um, let you introduce yourself and decide how we want to proceed. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to throw out a thank you to Adam Greathouse for uh, inviting me um, and to Mercilata for having me. Um, I'll tell you just a, a quick bio about myself. Um, I retired after 30 years in law enforcement, uh, retired in 2012. And um, I was uh, a sergeant or road patrol supervisor for the Eaton County Sheriff's Office. And throughout my career, I'd seen uh, um, just a, a myriad of violent crimes. Um, I was our chief uh, investigator for our fatal traffic crashes. Um, I was a police composite artist. Um, I was an emergency manager. So I, I did a number of things. And um, early in my career, actually, I, um, I learned that my great great grandfather had been the sheriff in Ingham County, which is the Lansing area, in 1897. And, and so, as a hobby, I would go to the library. It was long before the internet. I would go to the library. And I would uh, research the old newspapers and try to find um, articles about crimes that he might have uh, investigated. He was only the sheriff for two years. But as I, as I looked through the, the old um, newspapers at the Ingham County Public Library in Mason, I discovered a newspaper article that described just a gruesome, gruesome killing uh, or murder in 1897. And I recognized my great, great grandfather's name as, as the sheriff and, and the fact that he had investigated it. What made it more interesting to me was the fact that it happened in the town where I grew up and that was Williamston, Michigan. And uh, as I read, started reading the article, um, I realized how uh, macabre the whole situation was. And I'll tell you quickly, uh, it's, it's the, first book that I wrote, and it's called To Hell I Must Go. And I'll get into the title here in a little bit, but um, it was a story about a guy that came home and discovered that his wife had lopped off his mother's head and put it on a plate for him for dinner. And uh, the newspaper articles back then were very graphic about how they described the scene. And I thought, wow, that would make a good book someday. And so I went through 30 years of law enforcement. And when I retired, I had always kept that in the back of my mind and said, hey, now's the time to write that book. So I started digging into um, more newspaper articles. And believe me, um, I didn't have much more than that to go on um, in research and something like that. Basically, uh, in, in the 30 years since I found that article, you know, the internet had, had um, developed to the point where you could actually search things. And, and so um, in addition to the newspaper articles that actually were all over the country, there, were, there was um, newspaper articles that spread across the country. I decided to check um, the archives of Michigan and if nobody's, if you've never been to the archives of Michigan and Lansing, you're really missing out if you're going to do research, because they have uh, just a treasure trove of information. People donate their personal papers um, to the um, archives of Michigan. Um, there's criminal records. There's uh, blueprints, uh, original blueprints. There's just um, a treasure trove of information. And so I went there hoping that they might have the criminal records for 1897 in Ingham County Circuit Court. And lo and behold, they did. And so it, it was kind of like going to the National Archives because they give you a, your own four foot table, um, square table, and they sit you at it alone. And you have to fill out a little form about what you want and you have to put on white gloves. And this guy brought this card out with one box on it and he reached in and he pulled it out and he set it in front of me and, and uh, he said, people versus Martha Haney. And I said, yeah. And so he laid it in front of me and he took off. And so I felt like Indiana Jones. I opened up that uh, folder and the first thing I saw was a handwritten statement, an original document from my great-great-grandfather in 1897. And that document 
described exactly what happened, exactly what he saw when he went into that house and saw that uh, woman's head on a plate and saw her body smoldering on the floor because her daughter-in-law, after she decapitated her, had poured kerosene on the body and set it on fire. Uh, and it I, was just, a, oh yeah, I, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I just wanted to, there is like, I am, there is so much that I just felt <laughs> you, you shared with us. Um, and I just wanted to break in there and, and I feel like I sh everyone should have been prepared for this because you saw ahead of time <laughs> where oh. we're going. But one of the things I wanted to um, just come in at this point with, which a little bit of chat, just a little bit of chat was about genealogy and the road genealogy, like just knowing that and not even just like there's your genealogy, but looking at primary, you know, text to help you get going on ideas and also the distance between when you first thought this may be interesting to when you actually <laughs> sat down to do some um like i guess real focus writing about it i sure. just want to point out since the majority of people in my class may may not even like fathom that much time between a story uh, something they might write about and actually sitting down to do i want to savor that a minute because sometimes it's hard for me to even get them to understand why it's important to walk away from a piece of writing just for, say, a few days before you come back to it. Oh, sure. Uh, that was a huge thing. You know, I really wanted to write that book early in my career, but finding time to do it was a, a huge thing. And then as I started to write, I would write maybe for, uh, I don't know, a couple days, and then I'd put it, I'd put it off, and then I'd go back and I would read what I had already written, and then I would change things, um, kind of edit as I went along. And I'm just going to be perfectly frank with you people. I hated English in, in school. I hated English in high school. I hated English in college. And it wasn't until my, uh, my uh, going back to school during my career to get my bachelor's degree in management that I discovered how much I actually loved to write. I couldn't tell you the difference, uh, and I, you'll probably you'll probably have to bleep this out, but I, I couldn't tell you the difference between an adjective and an adverb, okay? I just know that I like to write. And so it seems to flow well. Um, I had very little editing done on my first book, and and I don't know, maybe you'll read it and go, oh yeah, that's painfully evident. But I actually, <laughs> I actually had a friend of mine uh, do the editing for me, and he used to be a, a, a high school English teacher. Um, <laughs> attorney, I'm, I'm sorry, I think it's unfair that our track does not have the laughter I clearly see <laughs> in the faces of some of the students who are on camera, and also myself. So I just wanted to unmute so we have it on record. Um, I think you have quite a few amen corners when it comes to the relationship to how much people loved English okay. yeah. <laughs> and, and writing and what they may be doing now or in their future. So, um, and folk, remember, if you have a comment or something, I will call on you if you put a hand up as we go. So I didn't, because when we do, when we have this um, recording, I don't want all those moments to just seem like it's silence. I wish people could see the the faces of the two people who are on camera, but you can't hear the laughter, but we are, I, I feel people are with you. Oh, good, <laughs> good, good. That, that, that makes me feel better. Um, and I will tell you that um, the question and answer session is my favorite. So um, don't wait till the end, if you got a question, put your little um, hand signal up and she'll cue you in and, and we'll go from there. But um, uh, so getting back to the original file um, at the archives of Michigan, they also had a handwritten statement from a witness who went into the house and he described the same thing, the head on the plate, the, the body smoldering. And, um, and then I, there was also a document from three doctors who had declared this woman insane. And there was a handwritten um, piece of paper, a full page, very small writing from the judge 
uh, who sentenced her to the home for the criminally insane in Ionia. And so beyond that, I wanted to be as accurate as I can. And, th and that's what I really strive for when I do true crime, because people want to know the details. There is an, uh, there is a, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but people love to read about true crime. And I don't know what the, what the attraction is, but they do. And so I really strive to be um, as accurate as I can. And so um, I went a step further and I checked at the, at the archives of Michigan and they actually had the blueprints, the original blueprints for each building at the um, home for the criminally insane in Ionia including the women's dorm, which is where this woman went after she was sentenced. Um, so those are some of the steps that I went to in a very, very, very old murder um, where basically I had nothing but uh, newspaper articles and I had um, those few documents at the archives of Michigan. Those documents also included the original handwritten warrant for her arrest and, and the, uh, the envelope that the, that the warrant was in, it was just fascinating to me. And uh, so I got that first book done and it was just a short one. It was about 175 pages. I like to kid around because I was a cop for 30 years that I like to tell people, well, I made it in big font with lots of pictures because I knew some cops would be reading it. Um, and uh, I usually get a little chuckle about that. But, uh, <laughs> well. Yeah. Well, I, th that was my chuckle. So <laughs> you got good. one for me. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned something about interviews. Uh, I think this was the interview you found on paper. Uh, but I got a question um, about interviews. Did you do interviews? Uh, not for that book, because there really wasn't anybody to interview. The The case was 123 years old. Um, I, I, I take that back. I did talk to, because I wanted to learn where the house was in Williamston. Uh, so I talked to a, a local town historian. I interviewed him very briefly. And, and he told me where the house had been and that it, it didn't exist anymore. Um, so I did go over to, to where it had been. And I realized, believe it or not, that on the day that I graduated from the police academy, now, you're going to find out how old I am now. Um, in 1981, um, the day that I graduated from the police academy, the guy that I went with, um, he had a little party at his grandparents' house. And guess which house it was? It was the house where this murder had occurred. And I didn't realize that until... I had talked to the town historian 30 some years later and he said, oh yeah, it's the house at the end of Elevator Street. And I was like, oh my God, I've been in that house. Yeah, how strange well, is that? Well, that just means things are lining up for you to come back and write this story. <laughs> oh, I guess, I guess. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, yeah, uh, I had a couple weird things happen too, but I, we won't get into that um, right now. If I got time at the end, I'll tell you a couple weird stories that happen when I write my books, so. Um, so one of the things I'm trying to pull together from the chat, I'm not sure if this is coherent or not, but it seems like people are talking around or somewhere about um, just true crime itself and why people read it or why, um, it, you know, what draws them in. Um, and I had a question well, no, someone made a statement is that um, they think it's morbid curiosity. Oh, nope, that's the wrong one. Uh, what, Jamie? Oh, people like true crime because it inspires them. So then that led me to inspire them to do what exactly? <laughs> but um, would you like to chime in here? Sure, then, yeah. Thanks. When I, oh, I'm sorry, were you talking to me? Yeah, I'm like, I, sure, I mean, I, I I'm why. talking to you, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm asking the student too, like, could you elaborate, inspires them to do what? But what do you think? I'm yeah. asking you also. Well, I'll tell you when, when I um, decided to do my third book, um, which would be, it's really hard to tell because I'm, it's like, I'm looking in a mirror. So I don't know if it's my right. It's this, this one, <laughs> this one, uh -huh. women. Okay, oh. I decided 
to um, not self-publish. I wanted to do a traditional publishing deal with uh, an agent and a publisher. And in order to do that, uh, you have to put together a book proposal. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but in the book proposal, you have to kind of, uh, you have to do a little bit of research and talk about uh, what, what your book is about and why people will want to read it. And so I did some research on why people enjoy um, reading true crime. And one of them is, is a morbid curiosity. It's, it's like opening up the refrigerator and you see a carton of milk and you know it's been outdated for three weeks, but you still got to take a whiff, okay? It's a morbid curiosity for one thing. The second thing is um, the, the audience for a true crime book, <clears throat> believe it or not, is women from about 20 to 50. Um, it, it might vary a little bit there, but it, it's young women, young to middle-aged women. And they read true crime for uh, two reasons. One, they like to um, they like to be scared without having to be scared. If that if that makes sense um, in the simplest terms. And the other yeah. reason is a lot of times they will put themselves into that situation to figure out how they would avoid that situation if it were them. And oh. that's, that's what some of my research discovered is, and that's why women like true crime so much. And it kind of fascinated me because I had no idea. I was like, what is the draw? And that's what it is. They like to, they like to be frightened without having to be scared. So what do you um, think of that? People who identify as women in this class, are you accepting that? Are you like, hey, um there's I can't really keep up with the chat because it's kind of it's it's about a lot of stuff so it, I feel like you all have stuff to <laughs> contribute to this and I'm doing a horrible job at facilitating it so I'm gonna um I have two hands up I'm gonna unmute um ask um Bailey and then Adri okay so go ahead Bailey oh, hold on <laughs> starting to get the video <laughs> start um yeah, a lot of that's uh, true. Like for me, it, it's fascinating because I love horror movies. And so it's not that far off to go to um, murder mystery or crime or something. And the fact that it's so taboo and that it's something that I would never do, but I want to read like why people would do it, like what makes them get to that point, like sure, sure. all the details, you know, why they did it, who they did it to, you know, is there a reason? Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. And I just like get reading anything I can get my hands on. So oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, plus the fact that you know, most people it makes And that's what happens sometimes to audio. Oh, okay. <laughs> See, something happened there. So Bailey, um, we'll come back. And then um, my next person, you can unmute yourself. Try it now. Okay. Um, so my thought has always been that it's like a chance to like go into the abyss but then know that you can close the door on it at any time that like that we can that real world monsters that we know exist we can go see them but then typically unless it's an unsolved mystery type thing it's one where you get to see the bad bad guy lose whether it's go to prison or get killed or whatever sometimes it's nice to see the bad guy get a bad end well in in most cases yes in some cases no but i i understand exactly what you're saying you you have the ability to go oh you know i'm too tired or, or this is too scary or too gory i'm just going to put it away for a while it, you have that ability when you're reading it yeah that's a great point all right um cammy you should be able to unmute um, now No. 
love technology just love it i don't even know what happened where you went okay yeah all right try now what all right bear with me okay I try again oh okay it works now <laughs> all right <laughs> Um, so I actually used to work at, um, Pine Rest. I used to work at the mental hospital and, um, I actually had to take a break, like thinking about it. Right. Cause it's kind of a stressful job. Um, I was a psych tech there. Um, I loved true crime and I had to take a break from it working there because I feel like true crime, like when people commit crimes, um, it stems back to like childhood trauma or like life trauma. Um, not all, but most. And it terrified me going to work <laughs> because these kids that I would work with, a lot of them, a lot were coming in, not by their, by their choice, but because of family issues. Mm -hmm. So a lot of like foster care kids and stuff. And so, um, yeah, I just, it, I had to take a break from, like, I had to quit my job and get help oh. because it just was so terrifying. Like, at night, I could not sleep because one, I was terrified for these kids going back to these homes and I felt so bad. Uh, but two, like just what's stemming, you know, like what, what are these kids going to grow up um, to deal with? And, but yeah, so I don't know. I just was going to make that comment that it was very interesting for me, but the whole true part kind of creeps me out. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's some people can handle it and some people, um, sad to say some people can't uh, some people won't read true crime they get they get frightened or they get concerned or they uh you know it's everybody's got their own little niche and um i i guess it really depends too on on the type of true crime i mean if you're talking about uh a book about a, a bank robbery um you know or something but uh in in my true crime just because of what I did uh, for a living, you know, I talk about murder. Um, and it, I just cannot tell you the draw to true crime. It's just incredible. There's a new bookstore that opened in Lansing um, this past um, this past month called Dead Time Stories. And it's all about Michigan true crime and paranormal stuff. It's a great macabre little uh, bookstore. And uh, if you get a chance, check it out if you like true crime and stuff. But uh... so I just wanted to um, chime in first. Thanks for clarifying, Cami. I thought you said I didn't I wasn't clear on what you were taking a break from. <laughs> so I was like, oh, do you? But then you clarify. I'm like, oh, the whole thing taking a break from. And then um, I also want to let people know that because the hands are going up and down, um, I will still call on you, but you, you can now unmute yourself. You don't have to wait for me. <laughs> that was getting a bit much. So, <laughs> okay. um, so it's called dead time stories in this story. It is. Okay, cool. It is. And she, ha she also has a podcast. It's called the so dead podcast. And she talks about some people would rather listen to it than read it. And, um, she talks about, uh, murders around uh, Michigan, around the state of Michigan. And uh, she's got quite a following. Um, so if you would rather listen to true crime, someone talk about it, uh, rather than read it. Um, it's a great alternative. Podcasts are huge right now, too. And the student, the, the people in this class do a really good job of anything you mentioned, finding it online and sticking it right into our chat. So I think we got the podcast already, too. So thank oh, you, everyone. Great. Right. Um, so coming back to like the, the, uh, thanks for making the distinction between all different types of true crime stories, um, or, uh, you know, true crime, different <laughs> kinds of crime, but in all of them, I think one of the things is the need to be, uh, what do you say? Be as, um, true and as clear about the actual events that seems hard especially if you don't have a lot to go on well i'll tell you what the secret is um the secret for me um only because i was in law enforcement for so long is uh if it's a modern day crime um let's say from maybe the mid 70s on 
uh, you can send a freedom of information request to various governmental agencies um, requesting their copies of their police reports regarding a specific crime. And uh, they are required by law to provide that to you within a certain amount of time. And uh, you, you may find a lot of names redacted because privacy is, is at the forefront of that. Um, and they will charge you a fee for it. And in most cases, it'll be an exorbitant fee. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in, in a, a little while here. But um, that is a, a wonderful resource. If you want to be accurate, you're getting it right from the horse's mouth. You're getting it from, from the police agencies that wrote the police reports. And that is a, another wealth of information. In addition to uh, what I did with my second book, A Slayer Waits, which was about uh, an elderly couple who was bludgeoned to death in their barn by an escaped convict from Jackson prison in 1955. And, uh, you know, I, I contacted some family members of the victims that, that are still around. And I got some background information about, about the victims. And then I thought, I wonder if any of the attorneys are still alive. Lo and behold, um, the suspect in that particular crime uh, was never represented by an attorney until his appeals in the 1980s. And so that attorney was still alive and practicing in Detroit. And so I went down and bought him lunch and we talked all about his client back in the early 80s. And then there was a, a, a young assistant Michigan attorney general who handled that case in the early 80s. And he was still around. So I bought him dinner and we talked. And so I was actually able to interview actual people that were involved in the case and gave me a, a, a first time perspective that I'd never known before. They described the people to me and, and their attitudes and, their, and what they saw and how they perceived everything. And that, even more than the police reports, was worth more to me than anything. Um, when I got done writing um, A Slayer Waits, I, did, I printed out four copies of it um, just on my printer. And I handed it to four of my friends. And I said, I want you to read this and tell me what you think. And each one of them came back and they said, you know, at the end, we felt kind of sorry for the defendant. And that completely floored me because that wasn't something that I had intentionally done. Um, I just put the, the, the case together from the beginning to the end. And in the end, all four of them said, we kind of felt sorry for, for the killer at the end, which just floored me. Wow. But, I, but I got that, that personal um, perspective of him and I put that in the book. And, and I got that from doing interviews with people that were actually involved in the case. That makes sense. Yeah. It that, was fascinating. The people who, that, but that was after you published the book? It was actually before I published it. Okay. Uh, so yeah. did that feedback have any bearing on any changes you made or no? No, I, cool. I was happy with it. I was really happy with it. Cool, cool. Um, all right. So I have another hand up. I'm, I guess the unmuting is not, there you go. Okay. Um, hello again. Uh, so my question is again about, you know, just doing interviews and stuff like when it is something that could be very personal and like, especially when talking to family members, mm -hmm. like how do you work around that? And even just, uh, reaching out to people to interview, like, is it actually as weird as it feel it? sounds like in theory to email up people out of the blue and be like hey can you tell me about this one thing that happened one time mm -hmm. you know <laughs> that is a fantastic question and and i'm gonna uh jump ahead into into my third book uh killing women which is about east lansing serial killer don miller in the mid 70s um for when i decided to do that book i'll tell you real quick i I wanted to interview uh, the sister of his first victim. And I had a, a psychiatrist 
that was involved in some later proceedings with that case um, that I had become friends with. And I asked him to do an introduction with her for me. And so uh, I did a phone interview with her because she lives out on the West Coast now. And she said, uh, it's very difficult for me to, to approach somebody like that and ask very personal questions. And she said, um, before I answer any questions, I wanna know why you're writing the book. And, and I hadn't even thought about that until she asked it, but it came right out. I said, people have forgotten who Don Miller is. People have forgotten what Don Miller did. And people need to know that Don Miller is getting out of prison. And we'll get into that in a little bit here. Uh, but so in that particular case, because it happened in the mid seventies, it actually, uh, he was arrested the summer that I was graduating from high school in 1978. Yeah, it's ancient history to a lot of you. Um, back then we started police cars like this. Not me, I'm yeah. still with you. I'm still old enough to be with you. Okay. So, um, so a lot of those people that were involved in the case were still around and I had, Believe it or not, I had met probably 75% of them throughout my career and had become friends with them. And so those interviews were very easy. Um, you get to the difficult question part that you asked. Um, I had uh, Don Miller's defense attorney um, was an acquaintance of mine because I had worked for him on some civil cases. And uh, so he set me up with Don Miller's dad to do an interview. And so the killer's dad calls me on the phone and he says, let's meet up in Alma. He says, I, I, you can meet me and, and interview me. I said, okay. So I went up there and I thought, I've got to get this question in because I'd heard rumors about it, but nobody ever confirmed it. And so I said that, to him, his name's Gene, Gene Miller. And I said, Gene, I said, I'm gonna ask you something that's very difficult. And you may answer it, you may not want to, but I said, I I'm gonna ask it. And it's a very difficult question to ask. I said, there has been um, discussion that your son had a relationship with his sister. And he was very upfront, he's very quick, but he said, yeah, his mom knew about that, but I didn't know anything about it. And that's all he said. But the, the point of, of me telling you about that is I usually preface those difficult questions with, hey, this is going to be a really difficult question. And if you don't want to answer it, please, you don't have to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And you'd be surprised. Now, Gene Miller and I have um, actually become kind of friends now. And... Uh, we talk every couple months. He wants me to come up and visit him. Uh, he wants to take me around and show me where he lives and all of his friends. And, and he actually called me up one day, just as a quick side note, after the book came out. And he says, uh, he says, I could tell he'd been crying. And he says, I'm having a little uh, trouble reading your book. And I said, well, I'm sure you are, Gene. I said, I knew it was going to be difficult for you. And, uh, he said, I didn't know some of those things that you put in there. And I said, I'm sure you didn't, Gene. Um, he says, I just wanted to tell you, you did a good job. Mm. And for, to come from the serial killer's dad, who still defends his son to this day. Um, wow. I mean, he knows that he was sick, but for him to say that to me meant the world to me. It meant the world to me. So those that was a great question i didn't mean to ramble on but um you just have to you just have to approach it from the aspect of um it's going to be a difficult question and you can answer it if you want to but i'm going to ask it anyway um and i always try the other part of that is i always try to find somebody to make an introduction for me to someone um i used don's dad to get an introduction to don now, Don wouldn't do a face-to-face -face mm -hmm. interview with me, but he's written me several letters. Uh, and that was something to me. Um, not to my wife, though. I'll tell you, she doesn't like that. <laughs> uh, I, I, and I'll, 
I'll throw out a, a quick question. Does anybody out there know how to start a letter to a serial killer? I'll bet none of you do. I'll tell you how you start a letter <laughs> to the serial killer with someone else's return address. <laughs> yeah. Um, my wife is less than pleased about that. I'm but sorry. Anyway. Okay. I um, wanted to add, so in doing these interviews, so in being very respectful and just laying it out there and always when you're interviewing anyone remember that this is always a a volunteer situation so they never i mean you should never lean on someone and expect them to do they're doing you a favor um but i saw in the chat so if you can imagine taking the scenario that um you just explained to us and turning that into family if we're interviewing, if you're interviewing members of your own family, I would imagine the level of difficulty only rises. So that's because in the chat, I saw someone say like, yeah, I'm interviewing family. I'm like, I'm probably, depending on where they are in their lives and what you're talking about, you may not get an interview. I mean, you they may not want to disclose because it's just too close to proximity. Sure. Um, and that just could be like, I don't know, you know, where is granddad from? They might not want to talk about that. Yeah. So, and I would just add that my grandfather never talked about his life um, in until he was in his 80s. Like when I asked him when he was before that, like wh where he was uh, growing up, he used to live in Georgia and they, he moved from Georgia to Michigan when he was nine or 10. And his answer my whole entire life until I was like almost 30 and he was in his eighties before he passed away. His answer was, I don't really consider myself being born until my mom moved me to Detroit. And that's how he would answer all the time. Oh, and really? I, yeah. <laughs> and I really wanted to know. But yep. when he was real, when he was older and he didn't have, I guess he was okay with visiting some of that. He talked a little bit more about his life in the, like the three years before he passed away. So, but before that, it was like, yeah, no. So well, there you go. Uh, in, in the, the letter that Don Miller wrote me where he admitted to four murders. Um, and I'll give you just a quick background. Cause I know there's another hand up there. Um, Don Miller, uh, he killed four women. And he hid their bodies. And one of them was found, but there was three that were still missing. And then uh, he broke into a home and he raped a 14-year-old girl, tied her hands behind her back, um, gagged her, and then wrapped her own belt around her neck and began to strangle her from behind. And at the instant, he pulled so tight that that belt snapped into two pieces just before she passed out. And at the exact moment that that belt snapped into two pieces, her 13 year old brother came into the house and he attacked her brother, choked him out and then stabbed him and she was able to escape. And so the reason that I tell you that is because when he wrote that letter to me, uh, because I had asked him, I said in my letter, I said, uh, is there some event in your life that you can track your behavior back to where you decided, oh, I know what I'll do for a living. I'll be a serial killer. Um, not <laughs> you can make light of it, but, uh, and he, he wrote me the letter and he explained his feelings uh, and how he took the lives of four women. But the one thing he did not say or admit to or mention was the rape of a 14 year old girl. Mm -hmm. He used to talk about that. And he said in his letter that, and the letter's in the book, um, you'll be able to read it if you read the book. Uh, he said that he'd taken the lives of four women um, and, the, and the three at the end, the, the, the second, third and fourth murder were copycats. And by that he meant he would see these women and they would remind him of his fiance and he would just explode and, and that's why he took their lives. They were copycat murders. And I think this is just me um, maybe reading into it, but I think the reason that he didn't mention the assault on the 14 year old girl, the rape is because that doesn't reconcile with his story about, oh yeah, she reminded me of my fiance. You can't say, oh, a 14 year old girl right. reminds me 
of my 23 year old fiance. Um, and that, do, that just doesn't fit his scenario. And so he doesn't mention it. Um, but... So I didn't get anything out of him about that. Well, I got a lot of other stuff from him. Um, so it was it was very unique. Um, not everybody can say they've gotten a letter from the serial killer. So I just want to clarify, you did not use a different address? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just... All right. No. <clears throat> so that, maybe. That, let me tell you something. That's exactly what my wife said, too. You did not use someone else's address? Yeah, I thought you were just, you know, but okay, interesting. <laughs> um, so again, people in class, remember, I like the subject matter we're talking about. So if you're ever, if you need to dip and get out of this, you are, there's nothing keeping you in this conversation. I don't want people to have nightmares or have to do something else because you said to this conversation. Um, but your vivid, like your descriptions. Oh, I'll come back because I see a, a hand raise. So um, go ahead. I see one. I think that's the only one. Um, let's see. You should be able to unmute yourself now if you have. Try now. Ask to unmute. There you go. Sweet. Um, sorry. Um, I missed like the early part of this because my internet was giving me fits of rage, but, um, this guy you talked to, um, did he, I'm trying to think of how to say this. When you talk to a lot of these, from what I hear, serial killers, they always have the hints of what's the word narcissism. Like basically they always have to be in control of it. Was he like that at all? Where basically, you know, does that make any sense? It like, does. And, and to be honest with you, no, he's, he's not a narcissistic mm. person. Um, he is very, uh, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? He's almost an introvert um, in that he hides behind his religion. He always has, he always will. Um, he thinks that that is his coping mechanism to keep from killing women. Um, unfortunately, it's very unrealistic. Um, he's not, uh, he's not in it for the headlines. Um, I will tell you that about three weeks ago, we shot a documentary about the book for Netflix and we asked him to, uh, participate and we asked his dad to participate. And, and I honestly thought that, that I might be able to get his dad to take part in it because we, had, we have a relationship, if you will. And uh, he said, I'll have to think about it. And so I sent a letter to Miller in prison. And uh, I said, hey, listen, you, you were kind enough to um, tell me about the four women that you killed and why you killed them in the, in the 70s. Um, how about, and, and he did that. He told me that he did that because maybe it would help other people who were um, having the same issues that he would or was having in the 70s. By that, his, his pent up anger, um, his inability to communicate with his girlfriend, that's what drove him to murder. And so I said, this is a much larger audience. You know, if you go on national television or international television, you know, you can, maybe you can help some others. And he sent me a, a letter back and it said, uh, I need to talk to my family to see what they think. I need to talk to, uh, I think he said his dad. And he said, I need to, to think about what's best for me. And that's the last I heard from him. Um, I suspect that they chose not to, not because it, it was uh, a blood mongering um, TV show that you might see on reels um, because it was a documentary. Um, I think that they didn't because on Monday of this week, four days ago, Don Miller had his ninth parole hearing and he knew that was coming up. And I think that's probably why they didn't do it. I don't know that for fact yet, but that could be the reason. And uh, to follow up with that, I don't know if he got parole yet. We won't know for about 30 days. 
that there's so many dynamics to especially a a true crime story that has current you know consequences and ramifications um unlike the very first one and i think was was the second one no was the second one um a serial killer yeah i mean was that person still alive and in prison the second no, book oh no, he actually um just as a follow-up to that book uh his case was going to be heard by the United States Supreme Court in 1984, 30 years after the murders, and he passed away about a month before the before his case was going to be heard. Okay. And and the Michigan Attorney General's office was concerned that he was going to get out. Okay, that's why I'm saying that. But some of the things you said about whether or not they would this person would participate in, I mean, these are real consequences. I mean. Yes. And so there's so many levels of concern or perspective that that go into when you're writing about something more current. I will follow up on mine later because there's another hand up and I want her to be able to participate. So you should be able to unmute yourself. Try again. There you go. OK. Hi. Um, Hi. I was wondering. Thank you for being here, by the way. Oh, um, I was wondering if you're at all like concerned that um, Don Miller, when he gets out, if he'll resent you or, um, you know, have a vendetta or anything, or do you have any concern about that? No. And, and people ask me that all the time. Um, yeah, I was a cop for 30 years. So, um, you know, I carry a gun with me everywhere I go. Um, and quite frankly, I'll tell you about uh, one of the letters that Don sent me, because I'll be honest with you, I worry about his dad. His dad's 88 years old. He just had mm -hmm. a kidney removed last year. Um, he has his ups and downs. And so every once in a while, I'll call him just to check up on him. And, and I wrote Don a letter after the book was published. And I said, hey, um, the book's out. It goes from the beginning to the end. I don't judge anybody in it. I just put down the facts and that's exactly what I told Gene and Don wrote me back a letter of, of almost, a, it was like a thank you card. And it said, um, thanks for taking care of my dad or watching over him. He said, um, it shows you're a very caring person and, and I appreciate that or something to that effect. And so, no, I, I'm, I'm not uh, afraid that Don Miller will come after me. He'll be in his mid seventies. Uh, if he doesn't get parole, this week or this month, um, he will be released in 2031. He will have served all of his time um, and he will get out and he'll be in his mid seventies. Um, so still old enough to attack young girls and he's already shown a propensity for that. So there's some legitimate concern in the community. Um, I, like I said, people have forgotten who Don Miller is and what he did and People didn't know, oh, what, what do you mean he's going to get out? Yeah, he's going to get out eventually. He's going to go get released into an unsuspecting public. And so maybe by this book coming out this year, maybe the parole board, well, I know the parole board saw it because I know the prosecuting attorney's office in Eaton County delivered each parole board member a copy of my book. People said, oh, did you write a letter to the parole board? I sure did. 484 pages, and it's titled Killing Women. That actually gets to um, something I was going to ask later, but I'm going to turn it over to the next question. All okay. right? You should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I sure can. For a second, it wasn't letting me. I feel like in a lot of like books or movies or TV shows, you see a lot of uh, like in the fictional universe, people being like, you're getting too close to the case. Like you can't accurately be uh, like doing anything with this case if you're getting too close to it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm wondering if, have you ever been like criticized for actively having some kind of relationship with his father or even like a minor relationship with him or have you ever felt like weird that you had that uh, closeness to something, even if you weren't actively investigating it? That's a great question. Um, no one has ever criticized me for that. 
um, I ha I've had a couple people joke around um, and they'll go, what are you gonna have him over for dinner? Um, when he gets out of prison, referring to Miller and, uh, but they were joking. So no, um, nobody's ever criticized that. And does it feel a little weird? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, I honestly, I like to, I like to tell people that. Um, maybe it's just because I'm, I'm not trying to pump sunshine up my own skirt here, but maybe, maybe I'm a caring individual um, that, you know, really, you know, Don Miller's dad, look what he had to go through. You know, his, he knows his son killed four women and raped a 13 year old girl and tried to kill her and her brother. Um, and he's had to deal with that for his entire life. Now, he has a good side to his family too. He's got two daughters. Um, one became a doctor, one became a career military person, and he's got three grandkids that have become doctors. So he's got a, a really um, supportive family behind him other than that serial killer son we don't talk about. Um, but he thinks his son was just sick back then and he thinks that his son has been rehabilitated. I would never tell him face to face that I would disagree with that, but and it is what it is. So um, getting back to your question. No, I don't, I don't feel weird about it. And, and nobody's ever criticized me about it. Um, I think it's a good resource to have because uh, I'm working on two more books and the, the fifth one will be um, actually an in-depth study into um, Don Miller's thinking and what was, what was going on in his head as he was killing women. So are both the next books related to this particular case or just the no, one? No, actually um, my, my next book, which is about, I'm gonna say half done, is an unsolved murder, 60, years, 60 year old murder. Oh, and, that's, uh, that's the one some people don't want because it's unsolved, so we don't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> How about if I throw in the caveat that I think I know who did it? And he's still okay. Yeah. Um, well, that does get to, um, I wanted to ask, like, what's the, I mean, people write for all different types of reasons. Um, I mean, it makes sense that the, um, the career you were in, but what, why do you do it? I mean, what, what do you expect to get? What do you want us to get out of it? Like, why for you? Uh, well, I'll tell you what I don't expect to get out of it, and that is rich. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, uh, I, you know, I self-published my first two books, and you make more money when you self-publish your book, but you don't get the national exposure unless you have a really good marketing plan. Um, with Killing Women, I've got national and actually international exposure because the company that shot the documentary was in the UK and they came across my book. Um, and actually there was two production companies there uh, that, were, that were considering it. One was with Investigation Discovery and one was with Netflix. Um, so I've gotten international attention, but the, the publishing company has all of their costs to get it printed and, and to get, um, uh, get it on Kindle and to do an audio book and all of their advertising and stuff. And so whatever's left goes to my agent who gets 15%. And then whatever's left from that comes back to me. So uh, I, I'm back to your original question. That's one thing I don't expect. What do I do expect to get out of writing? Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy it. It's uh it's not strenuous for me. Uh, I love, <laughs> love, love to do research. Um, to, and uh, newspapers.com is a treasure trove of information. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, love, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, and the because I live so close to Lansing, the State Library of Lansing, the Archives of Michigan, both treasure troves of info. I love to go up there and just spend the day digging into something. Um, the other thing I, I expect to get out of it, I would like to say that my latest book, I like to think that it, it may be responsible for keeping Don Miller, at least in part, for keeping Don Miller in prison for 10 more years. Um, because when people have read it, there's a public outcry 
what do you mean this serial killer is going to get out? And the book explains why he's going to get out. Mm. And I think it's, it, it's, uh, it's an edge an, excuse me, it's an educational piece, if you will, for the, for the public. Okay. I see two more hands and I'm also watching our time, but I do definitely want you to get your time in. So I'm going to go to Emily and then come back to you, Adri. Okay. You should be able to, um, there you go. Hello, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Sometimes I do have a little bit of trouble with Zoom with that. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here today. This is actually really fascinating. Um, I'm not much of a true crime person myself, but I might be after this. Oh. Um, <laughs> So I had uh, a couple questions in regard to publishing, I guess. Okay. Since you've now done self-publishing, but you've also gone through um, an actual publisher, what would you say that you uh, prefer? Would you be considering going back to self-publishing for your next couple books? Or are you going to stick uh, with like a publishing company? I am actually, I'm gonna stick with a publishing company. Um... And, and I tell people this all the time because people always go, how many books have you sold? How much money are you making? And I honestly, I don't keep track of how many books I sell. And if, if a royalty check arrives in the mail, I just throw it in the bank. I, did, I, it, I don't make a lot of money. And so with that being said, I, I would prefer to have the national exposure and maybe the opportunity for a production company to pick it up and go, oh, let's make a documentary about this, which is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and, and get my name out there a little bit. Uh, no, I'm not John Steinbeck. I'm not um, Ernest Hemingway. I'm Rod Sadler and I like to write and I do it, um, I do it as a hobby, um, but, but there's a reason for each book. Uh, the the fourth book that I'm working on, The Cold Case, um, I, I really do believe that I have developed a suspect and I've already spoken with the cold case detective on that case and passed on the information. Now, will it develop into some, to, uh, something? I don't know, but there's a reason for writing that book because I think I know who did it. And then the, the, the fifth book will be, um, delving into the mind of Don Miller. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I have a stack, literally a stack of letters that he wrote to another author writing a book about a serial killer that have never been published before. And guess what? They're gonna get published. So I hope I, hope I answered your question for you. Uh, you did. I have a couple more, but I understand if we wanna to get to Adri. Uh, some of that led really well, I think, into a question that Adam asked as well, though he has his hand up now. So okay, so maybe I should let one of uh, them ask. Adam, uh, uh, I'm just gonna unmute you because I don't know what you're trying to tell us. All I was gonna say is I can share, but um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Adri. Right. We'll come back. <laughs> Uh, I was just curious uh, with you, you said in your fourth book that you think, you know, who the killer is. So I was curious if you're worried about a potential defamation lawsuit on your hands of like accusing this person, if you're planning to do that and then them being like, Hey, that's not true. Well, that, that's a, a perfect question because I have played that scenario in my mind a hundred times. How am I going to do this? Um, I thought when the book ends, it'll be the last chapter in the book. And he is in prison. Um, he's a serial killer. He is in prison for murdering um, a woman in 1973. And he was also uh, charged in the murder of a 16 year old girl in the early eighties, but that case was eventually um, thrown out. But with that being said, I think that my way to get around that is that um, I can use his name if it's out there in public, in public record. And because he was charged in these cases, it's out there in the public. Um, there's no, no question that his name was in the newspapers as a suspect, as an arrestee, um, as a, 
a cold involved in a cold case um, where, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine defended him. Uh, so I did try to get uh, his records through my friend, but even though he's still in prison, there's still an attorney client privilege there. So I'm not too concerned about it. Um, he's, he's in his eighties. Um, I'd like to, to, to see the state police either say yay or nay, it was him before the book is published, but whether or not that happens, I don't know. But that was a great question. All right, thank you. And now back to you, Adri. I have been chosen. Um, all right, so uh, my question is, so when you're working with a nonfiction genre, you know, sometimes people try to want to use that technique where, you know, they're trying to get into the mind of, you know, like a play by play, you know, from the point of view of the victim or something like that. And one of the issues that ends up coming up when writing nonfiction is not putting words in the person's mouth, in, a, in the mouth of somebody who can't speak for themselves, either because they died a hundred years ago or because in your case, maybe they were murdered. Uh, but so how do you navigate that kind of dichotomy of, well, I can't say that they looked over here and saw this because that would be a lie because I don't know if they did. Well, um, I'll have to tell you first, I don't know what dichotomy means. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Momentary oh <my> panic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, the way that I've gotten around that is uh, if I put a quote in a book, um, or something someone said, um, I footnote it and I, and I name the source. Um, I don't, I don't um, fictionalize, if that's the term I'm looking for, mm -hmm. um, uh, a conversation with somebody. Uh, I'll give you an example in, in um, the book that I'm writing right now about the cold or the cold case where I think I know who did it. Uh, uh, there was a woman killed in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, I know for a fact because it was her neighbor that was quoted in the newspaper that said she came to my door and she said, I've got a knife stuck in my neck. And so I put that quote in the book where I put, or, or it will be in the book, um, where I put, she made it to the neighbor's house. And she said, I've got a knife stuck in my neck. And then I named the source. But I don't, I don't make up dialogue, if you will, mm -hmm. um, when I'm creating a, a scene or writing a, a section of the book. I just go by the research that I found and kind of work it that way. Does that make sense? Yes. OK, I'm back. Uh, um, uh... I think so. So like, even when there's situations where like, what you do know is that, you know, he had a quick, quick chat with the taxi driver about the weather. You don't try to elaborate that into an actual scene where it's like, yeah, they, you know, like, oh, how, what do you think of the weather? Oh, I thought, thought it was really terrible that day. Oh, I, yeah, no, I don't. I don't. Um, in my second book, uh, Slayer Waits, um, the killer had had made it back to the small town of Mason, and he he went um, to a cab, and flagged down a cab driver and got a, a ride into Lansing to the bus station, and so I just I wrote the that particular section is um, Buchanan made it to to Mason and and he went over to the cab stand and 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 some of the research I did I found out that the cab drivers kind of looked at him a little suspiciously and one of them stayed on one of them was supposed to get off duty but he stayed on and rode to Lansing with with his partner because he was a little concerned about the guy they were giving the ride to but there was no dialogue and so I didn't put any dialogue in there there was no um dialogue that I found in any of the newspaper articles so yeah I don't I don't try to create stuff that that wasn't there because because people ask that I had a state trooper ask me, he said, um, where'd you get that dialogue? You know, did you make that up? And I said, no, those, I, those were taken from printed sources and they're listed in the back of the book. 
And, and so here is where we get the difference between the creative part of nonfiction. So creative nonfiction and nonfiction. So, and some writers have gotten in trouble for this in the past. Like they, even if, even when they're writing about themselves, they say this is all true, but they have added stuff and not said, I brought this from other places. So I think you that's mean, a good I question. Add, I could have added stuff. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so I've got a sister who works in children's publishing and she has that issue when publishing uh, biographies for children, especially when they're in picture book form, because a lot of times the way you spice it up for kids is having people talk to each other. And then it's like, sure. ooh, but we're talking about Thomas Jefferson or whatever. And we can't actually put words in his mouth unless he actually said it, even though half the things he's saying have vocab too high for their brains. So, 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 in, so. in Killing Women, um, there's a lot of uh, dialogue. There's a lot of courtroom stuff in the in the latter section of the book um, during the trials, and so I used a lot of transcript dialogue, and I would put that right in there, and and I didn't footnote it. And I and when the editor got it, uh, she looked at the 400 and some pages, and she, actually it was over 500, and she said, number one, you have to cut this down. It's too long. And she said, number two, can you footnote everything? And I just went, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? So there was another you know, month of me going back through and finding all those quotes um, that I put in there. And I put them in there for a purpose. I just didn't footnote them. You won't see that problem with the next book. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> all right, we're going to um, go back to the last hand we have up and then, um see where we are there and try to wrap it up. But definitely yeah. if uh, we can come back to a little bit about how the query and the book proposal sort of work together now that you've made this transition from self-publisher to, hey, people are looking at you. Yeah. All right, so you should be able to unmute yourself now. Emily? Hi again. All right, um, so I guess I have a question about what it was like um, to work with a documentary crew uh, when it came to adapting uh, this book for, well, for that? Uh, it was exciting for one thing. Um, I actually have talked to six different production companies. Uh, the, the one that was uh, associated with Investigation Discovery, they backed out um, when they found out that um, the company that actually did come here uh, was associated with Netflix. And they said, well, we're, we're not going to do it if another company's doing it. Um, there's another production company um, that really considered it uh, real close, but they decided not to do it. Um, and there is another one from the A&E network, um, the law and, or law and Courts channel. I think they do like Live PD. It's that Dan Abrams channel. Mm. Um, they want to do something. And so uh, when you get the first phone call, it's like, wow, this is really, this is really taken off because they're in, they picked it up in the UK. Um, so the way they did that was they, they would call and, and email me and say, can you, can you get us this? Can you get us that? Can you put us in touch with the surviving victims? I said, well, I'll have to check with them to see if they want to participate. Here's a list of other people I think you should talk to. So I actually worked really close with the, with the production company. And then uh, they finally, uh, because they were in the UK, they hired a, a cameraman and a boom guy out of uh, Cleveland. And they sent them up and put them up here in Lansing. And uh, so I met with them. We did our interviews one day. They interviewed everybody throughout the day. And then the next day I took them to each murder scene um, where, where Miller had dumped the bodies. And then he interviewed uh, the victims, the two surviving victims at the end of the day. And, and we did it in Grand Ledge. And, and if you're not familiar with Grand Ledge, it's a really quaint little town and they've got a little island with a bridge. And I said, I said, you should shoot this. I said, you should catch them going across that bridge you know, kind of shoot through the rail. And he goes, listen, he said, you contact the production company that hired us and you tell them that you want to be billed 
as the associate producer. Because if I had one here, he'd be doing exactly what you're doing right now. So I thought that was kind of funny, but um, it was really fun working with them. Uh, I had worked with some production companies. I did a, a couple of TV shows back in the early 2000s called Accident Investigator. Mm -hmm. And I got to fly to Montreal and we did uh, two episodes. You can find them on Amazon Prime. Um, and uh, so I was kind of familiar with how they worked. And it, it, it's just, it's always fun um, to work both behind the camera and in front of it. Did, so, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, oh, actually, Adam had another question that he gave me permission <laughs> in the chat to ask. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, he wanted to know how selling the rights to that worked um, as far as multiple networks working on the same source at the same time goes. Uh, you know, that's a, a great question, and I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, well, I can to a degree. Randy Gilbert is the surviving, he was 13 year old brother to uh, Lisa Gilbert, who was the young lady that was raped. And the, only, and the only reason that I use their names is because they said I could. Um, mm -hmm. I've become friends with both of them. They're very dear people. And uh, Randy was approached by one of the production companies and they, they said, we're gonna send you a contract and we're gonna pay you $25 and, and the contract says that we have exclusive rights to you for 18 months. And that just didn't sound right to me. <laughs> and so Randy called me and he told me that. I said, that doesn't sound right. So one of the other production companies had talked to me and the, the one uh, associated with Investigation Discovery. And they said, um, uh, yeah, we're, we don't have a contract for you. And I said, well, what's this contract from this other production company? And they said, that's very unusual. If they want exclusive rights to somebody, it might be for maybe six or eight weeks, but not 18 months. And I think that the reason they paid him 25, he, they were going to pay him $25 was that way they could say, Hey, look, we paid you for exclusive rights, no matter how little it was. And therefore you can't go out and talk to any other production company. Now the production company that, that shot the documentary here, they were like, we don't care if somebody else is shooting a documentary <laughs> too, we're doing ours. Um, and they said that happens all the time. So um, I think each production company works a little differently, um, but these guys were great and there was no contracts involved or anything like that. As a matter of fact, they paid to fly Lisa in from California and do her interview here rather than have to fly out there. So. And I think they paid her week's wage while she was away. All right. Thank yeah, you. Sounds like it was sure. a really positive experience. Um, in the future, if we have more questions or uh, are curious about other aspects of the, the true crime, or maybe uh, would like to, should we decide to write our own, um, ask you like, maybe where to look a little bit more, would we be able to get your contact information so we could ask oh, stuff like that? Oh, absolutely not. I only give that, <laughs> I only give that to serial killers. <laughs> of course, you, you, but you, can, you can have all my contact information. Um, I'm on uh, Facebook under Rod Sadler author. Um, you can private message me there. And I also have a Twitter and an Instagram account. So there's multiple ways you can get a hold of me and I'd be happy to help you in any way I can. Absolutely. So everyone, um, you can um, unmute um, yourselves. We're at that point that we need to be winding down anyway. So they did have two things to look at, which was the, the query letter and then the book proposal. So my question is for this book here that you actually go looking, is that how you, is, did you go looking for a, um, publisher this time i did, I did. uh you, you're talking about for killing women yes um, yes i uh actually uh did i i had to do some research because there's there's so many different books out there on how to write a book proposal and i knew that was something that i had to do you can't just send out query letters and hope for the best because you're not going to get anywhere um i'll tell you i'll give you some tips about uh 
about uh, book proposals and approaching either agents or publishers. I chose to go with an agent and let them find me a publisher rather than try to go directly to a publisher. Each agent and each publishing company has very specific guidelines that they want you to follow because they get thousands and thousands of queries and book proposals each month. And a lot of them go right in the delete file. So the, the, the teaching moment here is if you're gonna uh, approach an agent or publisher and they have specific guidelines listed on their website, follow those to an absolute T. And when you put that proposal together, it ends up being about, mine was about a 60 page document, I believe. Um, uh, I'm looking it, at it right now. It is 74 pages. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. and, and That's the it, proposal, which is a lot longer than the query. Right. A query letter is literally a one page letter which seems really odd because you have to put in a hook, you have to put in a little bit about yourself, and you have to put in why you think your book is good. And you got to squeeze that into one page. Um, and so in my case, a couple of the query letters I put out, my hook was, what could be more frightening than the inevitable release of a serial killer? I mean, that that grabs your attention right there. What do you mean inevitable release of a serial killer? Okay, and it's a true crime book. That means somebody's getting out of prison. Um, and then I did a, a little blip about the book, a little bit about myself and, and hoped for the best. Now, um, the book proposal, 74 pages, double spaced, um, had no idea how to write one. So I had to research that myself. Now, when I do it for the next couple books, it'll be a little bit easier. Each time it'll get a little bit easier. But do your homework, follow those to a T. Uh, I'll give you, I know you're in a uh, you're in a hurry here, but I got to tell you just a quick story. Yep, go ahead. This, this uh, I, I submitted 50 queries to uh, agents. And the book that I got was uh, a guide to um, agents and publishers, the 2020 book or 2019, whatever it was. And it listed them all by genres. And so um, it said, make sure that your query letter and your proposal have all your I's dotted and all your T's crossed. It's got to be perfect. So I did the best I could. And I sent it out to 50 different agents. And about a month later, I got one that wrote back and he wanted to represent me. And it came in the form of an email and it's, it didn't say, dear Rod, it just said Rod with a small R and no comma. I'd like to represent you or your book. It was like three sentences with no periods. And it, it was just, it was like the guy was drunk when he wrote it. <laughs> And I knew, and I knew which which uh, agent it was. Yeah, I mean, I kept track of who I'd sent query letters to, and I I was like, oh my god, I think this guy's drunk. <laughs> and so we were going on vacation. So I said, I quick did a, a, a Google search and said, what do you do if you get a, a an offer, um, but you don't want to take it, or you want to uh, delay it? And and the, all the the other publishers said that. Hey, it's business. We all know that. Just tell him you'll let him know in a week or two. So I legitimately told him, hey, we're going on vacation. I'll let you know next week. And the next day, I got a letter uh, from an agent in New York that was perfectly typed. Everything, everything was perfect in it. Um, and she said, this is, uh, this is exactly the type of work we're looking for. We'd like to represent you. Um, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, this is a no brainer. So I sent a, an email back to the other guy and I said, uh, I think I'm going to pass. And he sends me back an email. One, one word. Why? And I was like, uh, because I found another agent I'm going to go with. And he goes, and I thought he'd be mad. And he said, 
oh, he said, that's too bad. He said, I really enjoyed your book proposal. Um, if that deal falls through, get back in touch with me because I'd like to represent you. And I thought, well, that was nice of him. Yes. Yeah, so okay. just make sure uh, um, all your, your I's are dotted, all your T's are crossed and follow those submission guidelines to a T. They may want one chapter. They may want three chapters. They may want, uh, uh, I don't know, they, they could ask for anything, but make sure you follow those to a T and uh, you won't get dumped in the delete file. <laughs> so I just want to clarify, you sent the query to a bunch of people and then you got this response. You got two responses. Awesome. That you, um, but the one you responded to. So the follow up to that was this 74 page document. What they wanted is more. Um, correct. Yeah, okay. because a, a lot of them will say send a proposal, or some of them may just say, "Hey, send us a query letter." Um, that's all we want, or send us a query letter and uh, a sample of your work, three chapters of your work. Everybody has different guidelines. It's it, it's nothing set, but but when you do a book proposal, make sure that the book proposal follows the standard book proposal guidelines. Don't stray from that. Because once they see that, they just hit the delete button because they don't have the time to look through. They could be they could be dumping a, a book about Harry Potter and not even know it because it maybe the the book proposal wasn't um, formatted right. Okay, well, um, I want to say thank you. I still have like at least eight other questions, but I <laughs> I will just hold on to them. Um, because I shouldn't do that. I'm going to hold on to that. And plus I got your email address. You gave me all that. I might write you a letter and use someone else's return address. I don't know. You know, if, <laughs> if your class wanted to submit any questions that they come up, um, submit them to you and, and you can email them all to me and I'll answer every one of them. Okay. They'll probably just be a list of mine, but I will pretend they're from other people too. Um, so everyone, you have the opportunity to unmute yourself. <laughs> Any um, parting comments? Be I'm nice. actually gonna, <laughs> what'd you say? I say, be nice now. <laughs> You're all set, go forth and publish, send queries and get stuff published.